As a supporter of First Liberty, you played an important role in bringing significant change in the real world. We're going to talk about the remarkable things you helped accomplish in 2023. Hi, I'm Stuart Shepard, and this is First Liberty Live. If you care about religious freedom as much as we do, and you care about leaving a legacy for your children and your grandchildren of freedom, we have a special opportunity for you here at this end of 2023. We have a $600,000 matching grant in effect right now. So for every dollar you give, it'll be matched dollar for dollar up to $600,000. Just click on the big red give button on our website, and you could be part of so much going on in the future. Jeff Mateer is executive vice president and our chief legal officer here at First Liberty. Hi, Jeff. Hey, Stuart. It's always good to have you on. He has the Mateer tartan tie on, and I want to point that out. It's Christmassy. It's very Christmassy, very Scottish. Yeah, very Scottish (laughs) today. Here's a question everybody should ask about any nonprofit that they support. I'm going to pitch it to you, and the question is simply this. Are you actually doing what you set out to do when you started. So, Jeff, in 2023, did First Liberty do what we said we were going to do? Well, you know, part of the problem is we, we established such a high standard in 2022. Yeah. When, when you think 2022, two Supreme Court victories, um, both of them being major, major precedent-setting wins. Well, I mean, how, how do you even come close to doing that? Well, we did that in 2023 and beyond. And we're going to talk about those wins and the impact of those as we go go along. We worked on literally hundreds of cases this year, so we can't talk about all of them. So I picked out some highlights here. It was more than it was hundreds because I went. I mean, mean, are you sure we can't talk about them? (laughs) (laughs) If we have if we have the whole afternoon, yes, we probably could. Uh, uh, Let's talk about some of the ones that got the most attention. We'll keep it zeroed in on those. Let's talk about the two at the Supreme Court. First, our faithful carrier, Gerald Groff. Tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, you know, the the Gerald Groff case and it's sort of, you know, how do you outdo the 2022 victory in Coach Kennedy's case? Well, what you do is you represent someone like Gerald Groff, a, 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 as we said, a faithful male carrier who simply wanted to, as part of his job, wanted to observe the Sabbath. And um, for years, he was accommodated, um, as, as we believe the law required. But unfortunately, the post office took the position eventually that they couldn't accommodate him anymore. And so that brought this case to the Supreme Court because after two losses, so losing at the district court, losing at the Court of Appeals, who said they were following a really bad precedent that was 46 years old that that said the words undue hardship just mean if there's any burden at all on the employer, just de minimis burden, then the employer doesn't have to accommodate the religious employee. Well, in a unanimous decision, and I'm going to repeat that because that just doesn't happen very often. Not at this, at this level of impact. No. no. So 9-0 at the U.S. Supreme Court says that the words, I mean, it's almost common sense, but the words undue hardship mean, mean undue hardship. <laughs> they mean that yeah. the business actually has to incur a significant cost or expense. And so... That resulted in Gerald winning, the case going back to the district court. But, it, you know, this wasn't just a victory for Gerald. It's really a victory for any American, any person of faith in the workplace. Because what it says now, if an employer seeks to restrict your ability to practice your faith, for instance, in Gerald's case, it was observing the Sabbath. Yeah. For, for others, it may be things like objecting to DEI training. Anything that you have a religious objection to what what your employee what this case now stands for it says your employer is going to have to accommodate unless it, it incurs an undue hardship which again means significant cost or expense to the business and, and one important part of this an aspect that it it really takes a minute to get is for most of our lifetimes we've gotten used to that other standard. So we don't even think in terms of asking for that accommodation because the the courts would have said, nah, you you don't get it. Whatever it is, you're not going to get it. But that's changed now. And for our children and grandchildren, they can ask for this. I mean, today you can go into your employer, request it, and the courts are going to back you up, right? Yeah, absolutely. And then we're seeing that impact across the country. Very good. I, another case that made it up to the Supreme Court for the second time was the case of Aaron and Melissa Klein. What happened and what happens next? Yeah, I mean, you know, you think the, the, the Kleins who've been fighting for a decade 
a decade. And the Kleins are the Christian bakers um, who had a, a baker in Oregon who, pursuant to their, their, their sincere religious beliefs, did not want to participate in, in using their artistic talent to create a, a cake for a same-sex wedding ceremony. This case has been going on you know, for almost a decade yeah. and been to the Supreme Court. This was the second time, Stuart. And for the second time, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in favor of the Kleins and has, has sent the case back to the Oregon state courts a second time, telling them, hey, Oregon courts, follow our Supreme Court precedent on, on religious liberty and free speech. Right. So we're going to have to go back and fight it we're, some more in Oregon. We're back in Oregon fighting it. But had we lost at the Supreme Court, the client's case would have been over and their rights violated. We also won some cases in the lower courts I want to talk about. Uh, the first one was Stephanie Carter. Let's talk about her. Yes, yeah, Stephanie was a nurse practitioner for the VA. And earlier this past year, the VA decided in, in its uh, so-called wisdom that they were going to allow elective abortions at VA facilities, even in states that outlaw abortion. And Stephanie was an employee in, in Texas, uh, in Waco. And she is a person of faith, and she did not, because of her religious beliefs want to participate in any way uh, facilitating abortions. And what we found out is when we took her case, I mean, the VA had no process to allow her to, 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 to be accommodated, to not have to participate. And as, as a result of our federal lawsuit, the VA now has a process. And again, this is another one that's not just a victory for Stephanie, but it's a victory for every federal employee who's being asked to do something that violates their, their religious beliefs. Once again, it's so important to know what your rights are, else you don't have those rights. If Absolutely. you don't exercise them, you don't have them. That's right. And, and Stephanie, you know, a woman of courage, was willing to stand up when her employer, the federal government, the, the VA yeah. told her, oh, no, you, you have to participate something in something that you disagree with. Another case that we won in the lower courts, we stood up for a synagogue in New York so that they could actually use the property that they bought. It's a, an oceanfront town. Tell us about that one. Yeah, it's Chabad of the Beaches, which is out in Long Island, and um, they bought a, a, a building that they were going to use to for, for, for their Jewish ministry. Um, and you would think, oh, great, you know, this uh, Jewish uh, Jewish congregation on, on Long Island, that shouldn't be too strong. Uh, it's too strange. But in this instance, the, the city decided that it had its eye on this property and it had been for sale for a while and the city didn't act. Uh, the Jewish congregation buys it. And then the city says, hey, you know what? We want that piece of property. Well, not so fast. Yeah. Um, we, we jumped into that with uh, some great partners and a law firm in, in New York and together we're able to get uh, an injuncti injunction stopping it and the result has been just earlier this month we're able to enter into a settlement agreement in which not only will the Jewish congregation get to keep its building but the the, the town there on Long Island is going to learn a painful lesson because they're, they've agreed to pay $400,000 in damages wow. um, to the Jewish congregation All so right. another great victory and it should send a message is you know you you can't mess with religious organizations. Very good. Also in New York, in the town of Aramont, people who followed First Liberty for years have yeah. heard about this town. It's been in opposition to uh, a, a Jewish community there for some time, and we finally got a victory. Yeah, another long a, a case that's been going on for years. Um, but with the help of the Department of Justice, we are able to convince the city of Aramont to agree to a settlement which will allow our clients to actually continue to meet in their homes and practice their Jewish faith. Yeah. And, and synagogue in Houston that we represented, we've got other cases that you yeah, want to I mean, mention. Yeah, I mean, especially as we think about these times where you've got the, the war in the Middle East and with the, the horrible, horrific attacks by Hamas against Israel, we're seeing in our country a rise in anti-Semitism. I mean, it, 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 it's horrible, it's painful, and it's outrageous. But the good, good news is for, 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 our, for, for those of the Jewish faith or persons of any faith, we're here to help them. And so whether it be Houston, where we just recently, um, right before Hanukkah, a few weeks ago, we were able to, to convince the city to actually allow them to have electricity in their meeting uh, house. Uh, and also um, in Beverly Hills, we had the city of Beverly Hills messing with a rabbi and his congregation, 
trying to prevent them, actually threatening to put them in jail if they met in their homes. In their homes. In their homes. But we were able to convince them, again, right before Hanukkah, to allow the rabbi and his, his Jewish congregation to meet in their homes. And to, and to keep that in context, you could have a gathering for a football party. You could have a gathering for a birthday party. But if you want to worship, you got to cut it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you can have a party, you can play, you know, you, you can have a game night, you could come and, and watch, you know, in Texas, watch the Cowboys, yeah. um, or watch the Longhorns play. Um, but if you're going there to have, you know, Jewish people usually walking um, to your home, um, that, that was a problem. Uh, sometimes wins in court lead to legislation being passed, and that's what happened in our case involving the Navy SEALs. Tell us what happened in the law with that one. Yeah, I mean, the Navy SEALs case is still going on, but let's not forget that at the beginning, when, when this all started, um, now over a year ago, it was because the Department of, of Defense had issued a vaccine mandate. And what they're saying is they didn't care if you had religious beliefs or not. You had to be you had to be um, vac- you had to be vaccinated. And so we originally represented a group of 35 Navy SEALs. I mean, the best of the best, the fittest of the fittest, who had religious objections to, to receiving the, the shot. Uh, that expanded later to to a class of all uh, members of the Navy who objected to receiving the vaccine because of the religious beliefs. And in that, we, we, we got an injunction on behalf of the SEALs. We, we got class certification, in w- which included all the members of, of the Navy who had objections. And then we got an injunction for all the class members. That led earlier this year to the Department of Defense that while well, Congress requiring the Department of Defense to repeal uh, the VAX mandate. Yeah. And so that, that's, I mean, and, and it's really, when you think about it, that was largely what we brought the lawsuit. Now, we're still representing those SEALs because making sure they're, they're, they're fully protected is still representing the class members. But let's not forget, the objective was to get rid of that mandate. And, and I think our, our lawsuits and our victories led Congress to take that action. This all creates an environment where a a very positive thing happens, and that is, as people start to understand that religious freedom is a right under the Constitution, a lot of these don't have to go to court. You you don't have to fight through years of litigation. And one example that that comes to mind is Kirk Cameron, who wanted to read his book to children at a library in Alabama. Tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, mean, and and so think about, first first we got Kirk Cameron, who, who, of course, as a as someone who watched TV in the 80s, I remember Growing Pains, right? Growing Pains, right? Yeah. Kirk Cameron, well-known, respected um, Christian uh, author. Uh, uh, Kurt is, is writing children's books. And he's been doing this where he's been going to, to libraries. And it's really a counter um, those from the left who are using the libraries to push their uh, progressive, you know, somewhat radical agenda. So Kirk thought, well, they're letting these other people in. So, you know, I'll read my book. Yeah, I want to read my book. This is America, right? <laughs> uh, and and so of all places, um, of all places, Alabama. In I a mean, library. Yeah, and you would think th- the story would come from New York or California or Massachusetts, but it's 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 Alabama. The Alabama Library uh, there in Huntsville, Madison County, um, decided, well, we didn't we don't want Kirk um, because, you know, he, he, you know, he, he may like have a religious message or something. You now, it's OK to have the progressive message and the anti-religious message, but you can't have the religious message. Well, you know, as you said, we didn't have to go to, to, to court. Instead, we just had to write a letter, yeah. which which it helped that we had support from the governor of Alabama. We had support from the attorney general of Alabama on our side, because I mean, look, if you're going to invite people into a public place, you can't discriminate because of their viewpoint. You can't discriminate because they're religious. And earlier this month, we convinced the city of Addison here in the Dallas area to to allow a, a, a small congregation, White Rock Chapel, to actually occupy their building. Uh, yeah, this is another one that just, again, Addison, Texas, you know, a, a suburb of, of Dallas. Uh, this historic African-American church was founded in the 1880s. The, their former slaves come together to, to, to have this piece of property to meet there. And uh, because of some disrepair through the years, a group has decided to revitalize that, that, that church in that historic location. Um, predominantly uh, um, reaching out to, to African-Americans. Sounds like a wonderful story except for some absurd reason, 
uh, people in Addison objected to it. And initially, the city council denied the right for this historic African-American congregation to reoccupy its building and actually exist. I went over to visit, and I asked him, we go in and look inside the building? He said, legally, no. We, we can't even go in and show you the building right they, now. They can't, because the city said they could not, in any sense, use it for any purposes, yeah. let alone for their services on Sunday or Wednesday or any time yeah. during the week. And so, you know, the good is it, it's it's it, 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 it's a year of victories at, at First Liberty. The good is, um, just a few weeks ago, the city of Addison reversed its decision, uh, and it is going to allow um, the church to, to operate just in time for Christmas, which is awesome. It's that, awesome. Last one I want to talk about. Sometimes after a win at the Supreme Court, there's a very special moment in real life, and I got to be up in the bleachers on September 1st uh, when Coach Joe Kennedy took a knee on the 50 for the first time in years of the legal battle. And, and Jeff, what was so remarkable about that moment was how unremarkable it was because the players were over singing the school song and the people in the stands were focused on them and clapping and all and one guy goes out to the middle of the field takes a knee for about 15 20 seconds totally unremarkable as it should be under the constitution but it ended up being a years-long legal battle but that one more than just the right for coach joe kennedy to put his knee down on the turf there it won a lot more tell us what that yeah i mean about. you know the coach kennedy case is eight years in the making but I'm going to quote our boss, Kelly Shackelford. The Coach Kennedy case establishes something that Kelly has been saying now um, throughout this year. We as Americans have more religious freedom today than we've ever had. Ever. Um, you think of the Groff case. That dates back to 1977. But this Coach Kennedy case, what it did is it overturned a 50-year-old horrible anti-religious precedent that had misinterpreted the Establishment Clause for yeah. years. So that's the first, first clause in the First Amendment that says that the government can't establish religion. And that had been misinterpreted so many ways that, that, that caused people of faith not to be able to engage in public, caused things like teachers and students to check their religious beliefs at the schoolhouse door. Well, the Coach Kennedy case blows that all apart. And that's why Kelly can now say, we have, you know, as Americans, we all have now more religious freedom than we've ever had. In our lifetimes. In our it's lifetime. It's just astonishing to think about. And it goes so much further than that because it also opens the door. All those Ten Commandments monuments that came down, all those nativity scenes in, the, in a public park that were, were torn down, they were all because of this lemon test, which is no longer the law of the it's land. No we can't the emphasize land. that enough. And, and again, you know, we can say we've won that case, and we can say that, that we've now overturned this historic precedent and that the Coach Kennedy case, I mean, they're rewriting the, the constitutional law books now. They have because to. They, because, because everything has changed. Everything that I learned in law school has changed because of the Kennedy case. But we can know, and we have that victory, but you know what? If we don't walk in that victory and, and we don't actually do something, Going we don't like take back the ground yeah. that, that we've lost, then what's, what's, what, what, what's, what's the point? And so that's why, you know, one of the things that we're doing here is restoring faith in America. It's one of our key projects that, that we implemented um, this past year, following up on the Coach Kennedy victory. And so, and, and that's really for everyday citizens to, to take advantage of this historic victory and begin to, as it says, restore faith in America, to not be afraid and, and, and actually take back ground that, 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 that has been lost and that we can advance religious freedom. Jeff, it's, it's always on my mind every day when I come into work that the only reason that we get to sit here and have these conversations, that we get to come here to work every day, is because of all the people that partner with us to make these victories possible. I mean, they are the engine that drives all of this, all this real change in the real world, because we actually did do what we set out to do. I mean, we're, we're in the process of doing even more in the coming year. But I want to give you a chance just to express appreciation from all of us at First Liberty to the people that make this possible for us. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there is no doubt that we at First Liberty, um, the attorneys, um, those who support us, 
um, our wonderful our, our wonderful colleagues in marketing and, and ministry relations and those who pay the checks, uh, our administrators here. We couldn't do the work. We couldn't represent the Coach Kennedys, the Gerald Groffs, because they never receive a bill from us. Ever. Everything that we do, they, I mean, all the lawyer time, all the expenses associated in the, in the costs, and in Coach Kennedy's case, millions of dollars um, spent on that case. None of that is possible. We can't do that. We can't represent without faithful supporters like look out there. Yeah. And, and so, again, I, from the bottom of my heart, I, I just want to thank you. I, th I thank you on behalf of, of us on the legal team, us at First Liberty, who have the honor and privilege to get to work on these amazing cases, to represent these amazing clients. Um, but I also, I, I thank you for the Coach Kennedys and the Gerald Groffs and the Gail Blairs and so many others. Uh, you know, 500, I believe, this past year that we've had the opportunity to impact. Very good. Jeff, thank you. We are all so grateful. Jeff, thank you for your time today. Thank you for the work you do. Of course. I don't know if you realize, but he's one of the best in the country at doing this kind of thing. And he chose to work here, and we're very grateful for that. Thank you, Jeff. We're coming up on the end of the calendar year, and thanks to the uh, generous support of one of our donors, uh, our, of our donors, we're able to offer a $600,000 matching grant that's in effect right now through the end of the year. For every dollar that you give, your impact will be doubled. Uh, each dollar you give, it'll be matched with another dollar. That's going on right now. If you just look up at the top of the page for the, the big red donate button, the big red give button, uh, you can be part of that. And you can have an impact on victories like this in 2024. First Liberty is fighting for what matters most.